Welcome to the Legacy Leaders Podcast. Are you doing the best for your client to help them create their legacy? Are you creating a plan that goes far beyond finances to help people ensure that it becomes the driving force behind all decisions? On this podcast, hosts Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller will help you with growing your practice and your client's peace of mind. Together, they bring the best and brightest minds to share with you how to help your clients develop their best legacy. And now, here are your hosts, Katie Beth and Stan. Welcome back to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Our guest today is creator, entrepreneur, strategist, coach, and author, and a speaker with a passion for transforming workplace cultures. Please join me in welcoming Dallas Burnett. Dallas, thank you so much for joining us. We are really excited to have you with us today. Thanks, Katie Beth. I'm so excited to be on the show today. This is going to be fun. Absolutely. We've already had a lot of fun. For those of you who (laughs) didn't get a chance to join us in the pre-call, we had a great time for a great show today. So I was hoping before we dive right in and ask you all of our hard hitting questions we have, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Tell us about Think, Move, Thrive and what inspired this journey that you've been on with your career? Well, I think that's a good way to put it. I've been on definitely a journey. I think I was counting it up a lot the other day. I think I've been in and worked in somewhere like 12 or 13 different industries. I'm a number seven on the Enneagram. So if you got an idea, let's run. And I'm always up for the adventure. And so my career has been very much that. It's not necessarily been that I'm jumping around. It's just that I have an interest here and we're going to run hard in that direction. And we fix problems and solve problems. And then we've got something else over here. So I go run over there. So it's just been fun. I've, I've been in, uh, ha- had some opportunities to be in a technical field. I was a water chemist for a long time, for about a decade. And that was fascinating to be able to work with some of the challenges with supplying our country with drinking water and things that go with the, along with that. Uh, and then I got into training and strategy and entrepreneurship and was part of some venture capital funded startup launches and all the craziness that comes with that. And also seeing some technical service businesses and was able to see how my passion for strategy and coming up with these great ideas were only as good as the people that were there to enact them and put that in motion. And so as I moved through that journey in the career, I started realizing that for me, that last mile, you hear about that last mile service in logistics, like that the person who delivers the package in business for me, that is ultimately comes down to the people. So the companies are the most successful in closing that last mile, that last 10% are the ones that can figure out how to create not just incentives, but create companies and organizational structures and teams that are highly aligned and motivated and engaged. So that's where Think Move Tribe came from. It was really, it was just birthed out of that idea and some of the things that I had learned in some of these startups and some of these companies that have grown and companies that I've worked with over the years. And so I said, okay, I want to do this for other people and see if we can turn this into a little bit bigger opportunity and see more companies and more scale. So that's where Think Move Thrive came from. I love that. So Think Move Thrive, so it's an app. It's a coaching app that drives performance. Tell our listeners a little bit about how the app works and what they can expect from it. Yeah, so Think Move Thrive does have a coaching system. That's called the one-on-one coaching system app. And that is our main technology platform right now. And Really where that came from is we were, I was leading uh, a company that was, it was in multi-states in the Southeast and it was full of mainly guys. It was a female owned company that was 92% male. So that is a fascinating, that's a fascinating setup already, right? But these guys were highly technical. They were very trained. A lot of them were engineers or technicians. And so they were great. They were great people. And they also just got on each other's nerves. And so they really just grinded a lot, right? And so when we came in and we're like, okay, we want to change the culture and open up some of this innovation that's hidden and open up some potential that we haven't seen yet. One of the things we had to get these guys to do was work together better. So we started instituting this coaching system. We designed it from scratch and we instituted this coaching system where we empowered these technical leaders to be coaches and essentially turn into that and started shifting their perspective from just transactions to being more transformational, engaging their teams and not like a spreadsheet, but like a person and a human being, but giving them the tools and resources to do that. And so we created the coaching system. It was fascinating. I just got these numbers back this past year. We launched the coaching system during the great resignation during COVID. 
it was the only major technology that they had put in that year and any major changes, everything was put on hold except for that system. And that year, the company saw their already low turnover rate drop 63%. So it went from 15% to five that year when we launched that. And so they were very excited. They were our first client on that system. They're still running it today, but it was really a solution for me. I needed a way to make sure, because I mean, I would talk to one of the leaders and I would say, hey, are you coaching your team? Are you developing your teams? Are you developing your employees? And they're like, yeah. And the next guy would say, yeah. And the next guy would say, yeah. And I'd say, how are you doing it? And he'd say, well, I'd take him out for beer on a Friday night and invite him over to the house to watch a ball game. And it's like, oh, that's not exactly what I was thinking. And the next guy says, well, I just tell them what I want and I can get them to do 80% of what I want just by yelling at them. And it's like, well, that's not exactly what we're looking for either. And another guy's doing it totally different. So I have 10 offices all over the Southeast that each are run by 10 different guys, all great, but they all did coaching and development their own way because none of them had been trained in it. So this allowed us, this system allowed us to be able to really standardize that process of coaching and development so that we knew there was a baseline in place that every employee, we could drive coaching and development further down in the organization so that we didn't have all this random development going on. We had more controlled uh, development of our team members. And it, it really worked. It helped connect in the team members to their ops managers in, in a way they hadn't been able to do before. That's incredible. I love the idea of a systemized system of development. I do feel like that's one thing a lot of workplaces don't do well. There are some people that tend to be natural leaders and really good at that. And then there are a lot of people that are good at other leadership things. So they become the boss, they become the CEO, they become the the COO, the HR person, the whoever, but don't have, they're not, it's not a natural skill set for them. And so I love the fact that you took that and turned it into an easy implementable system. I think that is great. And I, I love the success stories for that as well. Stan, I know you're brimming with questions and I think I've taken all of them so far. What questions do you have for Dallas about the system, the app, the program, all of it? Yeah, I have a, have a couple of big questions. My first one is, I know, Dallas, you do a fair amount of consulting, which means that you get to go into businesses, you get to see a lot of what's not working, and you have the perspective of the consultant. I'm curious, just from all the consulting gigs that you've had out there, what would you say are a couple of the really big common mistakes you see leaders in a business making that that make the whole work environment less empowering than it could be? I would say there's two big things uh, that I've experienced in this. Number one is that we all make assumptions, right? We have to get through the day. We're going to make assumptions to make decisions because we don't, none of us know everything. So we're going to make assumptions. The problem is that a lot of leaders assume their company culture is a certain way or assume their employee engagement levels are a certain way. They don't really know. They haven't put a baseline in place. Maybe they started, I was talking to somebody the other day and they were like, we've started off as a company of like five or six people and grown to like over 100 or 200. And we're still doing things the same way that we did that was working really good when we had a team of 10 and things are not working so good now. But for all the time in between, we just assumed hey, we'll just do the same things. It was working then, it's going to work now. And so one of the things that as companies grow, it tends to become harder to maintain culture. And you have to be more intentional to create that same level of connection and inspiration that initial group had, that energy that they had. There was something about that original group that just had this really, this kindred spirit, this fire, this passion. And then you wonder why when you're two or 300 people, it gets diluted. Well, if there's nothing that you've done different as that has changed around you, then you tend to run into a lot of, of problems. And I would say that goes along with the second thing that I've seen, and that is just a lack of a intentionality behind creating a culture that you want, that you think that your team members would want to be a part of. Culture doesn't, it's very dynamic. And so when we talk about company culture, it can change. There's a lot of things that can change a company culture. And so to create the culture or shape the culture or strengthen the culture that you have to be really intentional about it. And most leaders are, especially founders, they're coming from a, a technical expertise that launched their business. If you go and you're a plumber and you start your own plumbing company and you grow, well, your expertise is in plumbing. It's not in, you know, having a hundred employees that you're trying to figure out how to motivate, you came from this technical background, whether it's IT or whether it's some other thing like that. So I would say 
their lack of experience in creating, shaping, and growing, strengthening culture is something that makes it more difficult because then they're making assumptions again, and, and they don't know what to, what they don't know. So that's usually yeah. what we see. So the other question I have is is a big question, and I know that the answer to it is bigger than you're going to be able to give us probably in this podcast because you wrote a book about it. You've got a whole consulting business around it, but just in the limited amount of time and space we have here today, what are two or three, like, I want to say, quick, easy, like secret sauce things? Like if if, if I walk into a company and I want to create, if I want to really create transformational change, mm. there are two or three like stock things I can pull out of my bag and say, if we do these things, you know, this, this will work. Yes. Oh man, you're right. We don't have enough time on, right. the, on the show, but I've got some, I've got some great ideas for you. I'd love to share it. We're about to come out with a, an ebook called the ultimate guide to employee engagement. And so one of the things that we, we have in that is two ideas. It's very simple. And, and it goes along with the book that lift that we just came out with in October and that is, if I am in a leadership position, you if you're going to have initiatives, your initiatives have m- a much greater success of being successful if the team that you have in place is very engaged. Your engagement is the key. Engagement is the key to profitability. Engagement is the key to lower turnover. Engagement, engagement, engagement. And so when we have a strong culture, we tend to see that engagement is pretty high. And so how do we create engaged employees? So these things go out. It's to your question. And there's two main ideas, and we'll talk about these two kind of big ideas, and then we'll talk about some things that can, the more tactical ideas that you can implement at the level of your operation. Number one is connection, and number two is inspiration. When you think about engagement and you boil employee engagement down to its fundamentals, what we believe is that it is all about the organization, the manager, the team leader, their ability to connect with employees, not only connect employees to their leader, but connect them to the organization, connect them to their work, do they, and then also connect them to their future. So there's a lot of things when we say the word connection, we're talking about connecting to. If we can do that, we're going to have, if we have connected employees and team members, we're going to have engaged in employees and team members. The second thing is inspiration. Everybody wants to have that drive to get up in the morning and be excited to come to work. And that energy, the energy that you need to get up and get there early to sustain you for late hours and long hours comes from this inspiration. So when you think about connection and inspiration, you want to think about like, okay, well, how that sounds great, Dallas, but like, that's very fluffy. You know, how do I do that at my business? Because I've got a team of five people and what am I supposed to do to go and connect and inspire them? And so one of the things that we see that companies miss the ability, the opportunity to, it's just really easy and it's very cheap. The, the cheapest thing that you can do to connect people is to give them something to connect with and be inspired by. So most companies overlook really fleshing out their mission, vision, and purpose. And I know you hear mission, vision, purpose, and some people put them up on the wall. And, and if you ask their employees, well, what's your what's the five you know values that you have in the company? It's been on the wall for 20 years and they can't even say what the values are. So that's just because you put something on the wall doesn't necessarily mean that it is connecting the employees with those or inspiring those employees to move. So here's a cool little technique. We did this at the company I was telling you about is we want to infuse those into the organization. So number one, if you haven't got a list of five values for your company, Don't just go into a room as an owner and create those. Bring the employees in and say, hey, we need to do this together. What do we value? What is the non-negotiables? What is it that literally, I heard this the other day, makes you angry if it doesn't happen or does happen? Use that to kind of flesh out the values of your organization. The second thing is, I'm going to take those values and I've got to land the plane. Because if I say, I value integrity, and you say, well, yeah, I value integrity. So did Enron. That was one of their that was one of their values that was on their wall. So what does integrity mean to you? What does it mean to me? And then how do we come to an understanding and really infuse that? Well, number one is I would create an, a recognition around that immediately. So first of all, we may have a workshop and say exactly that. What does this value mean to you in action? And what we're trying to do is get to a behavior. So what is a behavior 
that exemplifies integrity. And so in this one instance, this company there, they had the ability to, they were adding technical details to these reports. So making sure that no one made up any numbers, that every single number was measured and precise and accurate and correct was a great example of integrity for this organization. Uh, when we see an example of that as a manager, I would do this. In the companies I've owned in the past, I would say, look, if you find somebody that is exemplifying this behavior, it links to this value. I said, you can give them an award. You give them, and it's different. It could be any kind of, name the award, something fun. And you nominate them, and you have to nominate them. You have to send me an email and say, I want to nominate this employee because I saw them doing this behavior that's linked with this value. Now, to do that, the manager has to actually know what the values are to nominate the employee for the award. So then I get that. I can write a handwritten note. I get them a $5 QT gift card or a $20 Amazon gift card, throw it in the envelope. Do I give it to the employee? No, I give it back to the manager. They can give that to the employee. And now the employee gets a handwritten note from me thanking them for living this specific value, which they know the manager had to communicate up on their behalf. So they're like, wow, that's awesome. Then the manager gets to give them a gift, which, man, the manager now looks like a hero to the employee. Now, the manager knows the value. The employee gets reminded of the value. And they are positively reinforced because they got a $5 gas card or something like that. It doesn't have to be expensive. But what we're trying to do in all these situations is connect the employee to the organizational values, to the organizational mission, connect the managers and the leaders to that and do it in a way where it's ongoing so that we can not just put them up on the wall and nobody pay attention to it like a billboard on the interstate. We want to infuse it into our culture. So that's really what we do at Think, Move, Drive and the consulting. The coaching system is just one thing, and that's definitely a big thing. But it's really about how to create a performance management system in your organization to strengthen or improve the culture of your organization. So I hope that does that one thing that answered your question a little bit. That was a great answer. answer. That was a terrific answer. Yes. Well, good. It's definitely okay. something that takes a we... attention. Yes, absolutely. No, I love that. But, and very logical. And I don't know about you, Stan, but as Dallas was talking, I kept thinking of personal interactions that I've had, places that I've worked where I wish we had implemented some of these things as a boss. I wish I had. It's so simple. It's so simple to encourage people and point them out. For me, the gift card's great. I, my love language, if you will, is, you know, words of affirmation. And so knowing that my manager went to my boss and told him some him or her something nice about me, that would be enough that it would really inspire me. And so I love the fact that kind of no matter, maybe your love language is, is gifts. Well, we've still touched on that. So I love and just just very simple, a simple way to really recognize and keep those managers involved and remembering what it's like to be working some of these other jobs as well. So I, I love that. I think it's just such a simple and very practical solution to implement. So good stuff. I want to, before we run out of time, talk about your book. You've actually written a national bestseller, Lift. So tell us what inspired you to write Lyft. And for our listeners, what can our readers, what can readers expect from Lyft? What is it about? What practical advice? What are you going to teach us in the book? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, thank you, Katie Beth. I, I wrote Lyft from really an experience that I had with a leader in this organization we've been talking about. And uh, it was interesting because when I first arrived and was surveying the landscape, i just saw this guy and I was like, man, he is, he's got it. He's, it's like you were saying other, a few minutes ago, there's some secret sauce stuff that people just get it and they can run hard. It's like, man, this guy, he's got it. He is a really big time leader, but he's not in a leadership capacity whatsoever. He's not leading the way he could. He's not leading. So ongoing conversations with him on Monday mornings, he would come in and we'd start talking about, I was coaching, uh, like third grade girls soccer at the time. I said, come on in. He's like, well, how'd the team do this weekend? So we get into conversation. We're just talking on Monday mornings. Through the course of those Monday morning conversations, I start sharing some different ideas. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Here's some things that we're going to try to implement in the organization. Here's, And he's just kind of like, okay, I see it, but you know, not totally bought in. And he just told me one day, he looked at me and said, hey, Dallas, I just want you to know something. He said, man, I'm a performer. He said, I'm not a coach. I'm a performer. And I told him, I said, no, I said, I don't believe that, actually. I need you to be a coach, and I think you are. 
And long story short, he ended up coaching a his son's basketball team for the first time. And it was such a transformational experience for him that it just opened his eyes. He's like, man, I'm talking to these eight-year-olds and I, they've got the same problems that I've got. These team members I'm working with on my project team. Like, it's the same thing. I'm trying to get them to be motivated, them to buy in and all these things. It's the same thing. He goes, I got to figure this out. And so that just exploded the Monday morning sessions and really just went, it just was awesome. And so we just had a great time delving into a lot of interesting concepts. And I watched him go from a project manager who would work really hard for his, you know, 10 hours, four days a week and check out and go play golf on Fridays to then becoming an operations manager of that, then a regional director. And now he's over multiple regions running two thirds of the organization and really having an impact on the company as a whole right now with all his input. So that in, in and of itself, his story in that context was very inspiring to me and seeing him grow and develop at such a fast pace because he went from that to double regional director in like four and a half years. And so just exploded. And so when I left that organization, I was starting another company and I just wanted to capture the ideas And I wanted to do it in a way that kind of honored that story, but also spoke to what we had created and done in that organization, because we did a lot of transformation of the culture of that company. And he transformed as an individual. So we created this fictional story. If you like Business Fables, that's the other reason I wrote Business Fable. We do leadership summits for private clients. And so one of the things I've always found out, what I realized pretty early on, after about four or five years of doing these summits, you get to the end, you're like, well, how did we always have a theme or a book or something that went with it? And every time we get to the end, it was just a normal leadership book. It doesn't matter if it's Simon Sinek, which is great, or some other book, they would be like, oh, it's okay. But if we did something so simple, it was like a business fable, like the energy bus or the fish philosophy, or even Patrick Lencioni's five dysfunction of a team. If you did anything like that, had a story, everybody would come back with raving reviews and they'd be like, this was amazing. I got to, I saw myself in this character. My boss was just like this person. This isn't. And so the energy was just out the roof if we did a business fable. So I said, look, if I'm writing another book, There's no way I'm just writing a dry business book. I'm going straight for business fable because it seems to connect with more people and be an easier read. And so that's exactly what we did. Lyft is a business fable that is all about how to create, strengthen, and shape culture, the culture of a team or the culture of an organization. And we wanted to make it accessible. So you kind of meet the characters early on. Scott is the main character and he's going through and navigating some up and downs. He's kind of in the beginning, he's just disconnected from his work and his team. And then he's thrown into a situation and it just goes from there. So it's a fun, it's a fun story, but we also slide in some very practical, applicable, just like the value thing that I was talking about earlier example, slide in some practical advice and mindsets into, into Lyft. So that's where it came from. Well, just so you know, I, I love have my that. Copy. Uh, Stan's already my copies on the way. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. It's that's perfect. No, I, I love it. And the description I think is great. First of all, you don't get to use the word fable nearly enough in business. So I love that it's not just a business how-to book, but it's a business fable book. It yeah. does make me, it doesn't sound like a dry book. And I have a lot of, of how-to books and educational books for business, for marketing, for all the different things that I do. But this is really interesting. And so I can't wait to dive in and kind of comb through there and see all of the different things about just different ways to revolutionize and rethink your leadership abilities. And so for our listeners that are listening and maybe this is an area where you're struggling, you can actually grab a copy of Lyft today. It is for sale on Amazon. It's Lyft by Dallas Burnett. And we will link that for you in the show notes as well. So I know from a personal standpoint, I can't wait to dive in with that. Uh, The last thing I have for you, and then I'll Hopefully we'll have time to let Stan ask one more question too. But the last thing I have for you is you also, on top of being an author and a speaker and doing all of these other things, you also have a podcast as well. So tell us about the last 10%. Yeah, so, Having yeah. heard you speak for a few minutes, I think I have a guess on what that might be about, but you tell <laughs> us a little bit about the last 10% podcast. Well, thanks. Thanks for asking about last 10%. And it is, yes, we are all about helping leaders increase their performance and live in what we would call the last 10%. The title comes from a quote 
uh, from uh, in, in the 80s, there was a computer programmer at Bell Labs that made the quote that the first 90% of any project takes 90% of the effort, and the last 10% of any project takes 90% of the effort, which is obviously 180%. Oh, yeah. It doesn't add up. It's called the tongue-in-cheek 90-90 rule. And so if you ever think about any project that you've been on, whether that's in any type of, whether you're building a house or working on a computer project or anything that you've done in your life, that last 10%, the closing out, the finishing well, finishing strong, uh, it's just so hard. It just takes so much effort. And so we like to have guests on the show that have what we feel like are living in the last 10%. So we've had some amazing guests, a very, very eclectic set of guests, everything from Mount Everest climbers to futurists. But it's been really fun and, and it gives us a way to stay connected and, and produce content for leaders that need encouragement, need some inspiration. And, and that's how we do it. So that's the last 10%. Yeah, so I, do I love have it. One. That is great. So for our listeners, after you finish this podcast, be sure you catch the last 10% podcast episode as well. Go ahead, Stan. I was going to say, I do have one one last question. And Dallas, hunches, the question I have is the question you may have thought about. And that is, given all the work that you do to make an impact on companies, to help people grow and become better leaders, what do you see if, when you are older and you're reflecting back on your life, what do you see your legacy as being? Oh, man, that's a fascinating question. And I love the idea of beginning with the end in mind, right? That's been around for a while. And I think for me, I, I do think it's fascinating because I think that I started my career in sales. And you're always going for the next sale. You're going for the next kill. And that's all great. And if you're in a sale, do it because that's exciting. Whatever energizes you. I moved into a place now where I get energy from other things. And what I'm seeing more now that I get energy from is people that have either the light bulb go off or they move through an obstacle they didn't think was possible. You know, their business is the opportunities are opened up. They didn't think existed. So I think for me, the legacy would be just to finish well and finish strong, live in the last 10%. And I think for me, that means really, really taking everything that I have and being open to sharing that in ways that help other people and, and as it relates to business and individuals. So I guess I started my career as a performer and I feel like I am a absolute, the realm of coach now. And so I enjoy that. And so I would say that for me, it's coaching. Uh, whether that is in a consulting role or whether that's in one-on-ones or whether that's in just sharing information through Lyft or podcast or anything like that. That's what gets me fired up is to see other people achieve uh, success in, in their endeavors and, and live well. So yeah, that would be, that's my goal to, to do that well to the end. So a, a great answer. Yep. Inspired answer. I would say. A great. Thank, yes. thank you. Very inspired. Very inspired. Well, for all of our listeners, Thank you so much for listening to the Legacy Leaders podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Our guest today was Dallas Burnett. And to get connected with Dallas, you can visit thinkmovethrive.com. You can also connect with him on LinkedIn and you can get your own copy of Lyft on Amazon. Be sure to check out his podcast as well. We will link everything for you guys in the show notes. Dallas, thank you again so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. You've been listening to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller. For more information on them and the show, please visit PinnacleLegacyLaw.com. If you like what you've learned today, do share the program with your friends and subscribe wherever podcasts are found.